Hi, I'm Alan Van Fleet with Greenberg Traurig in Houston, and today for the section's oral history project, we're interviewing Stephen D. Sussman, who is an extraordinary litigator and the founding partner of Sussman Godfrey, not only in Houston, but around the country. Steve, thanks for being with us today. My pleasure. You grew up in Houston in the 1950s. Who, who were your earliest influences? Well, uh, my earliest influence, and my biggest influence was my mother, obviously. My mother was a, uh, a lawyer. She was uh, the first woman in Texas who uh, was admitted to the Supreme Court bar. She graduated law school in 1933 or 4, University of Texas. So, and, and when my father passed away in 1949, she went back to the practice of law. So she was a real pioneer as a woman practicing law alone in Houston. And uh, she never remarried, so she was obviously a huge influence on, uh, on me. Uh, uh, you know, she, I knew both my parents. My father was a lawyer, too, so I, I definitely have to put her as the biggest influence on me uh, growing up. And so were you and your brothers destined to be lawyers? Absolutely destined. We, we never had a choice. It was like, you know, both your parents. Now, I was eight when my father passed away, so I didn't know him that well. But, uh, you know, my mother kept the legend alive. And so, uh, yeah, uh, clearly going to be a lawyer. And so the first step was to leave Texas and go east for uh, college at Yale? Yes. The, well, my dad had gone to Yale undergraduate and Yale Law School. And uh, my mother had gone, I, I mean, the history I can, it's hard to figure out, but she had gone to his 25th reunion uh, from, I think, from law school. And it must have been in the mid 40s, uh, three or four years before he passed away. She met some of his friends, and when he passed away in 1949, she kept in touch with his law school buddies. And there were some undergraduate people, too, but some, yeah, I couldn't, I don't remember who was who. About three or four of them then became kind of mentors of my brother and I growing up. And so by the time it came time for me to go to Yale, which she wasn't too hot with that idea. She thought I should go to Rice where it was free, or at least the University of Texas where she had gone. Uh, but she understood that it was probably inevitable, having heard so much about Yale and having put me in touch with so many of his classmates. That that so I, we I got a, actually had a scholarship from the Yale class of 21 to go to Yale, uh, and uh, so you know Yale was where my father went, and then my brother went there, and then my kids went there, and his kids went there. So it's we have a long, long history uh, of Yale College, at least. Now, when it came down to law school, we went home. Well, after you did very well at Yale, learning a Phi Beta Kappa key, you, you No, did... I was not a Phi Beta Kappa. No. You got some bad information, but keep it. I like it. I like it. Uh, but, you did, but you did the I, expected thing and I, came back to Texas for law school. Yeah. Uh, my mother, well, again, said she thought that she had... The scholarship didn't pay, obviously. In those days, it was like $500 or something. And I had to work in the dining hall to, to earn the scholarship. So... Uh, when it came time to law school, my father's class at Yale again offered me a scholarship to go to Harvard Law School. I wanted to switch colleges, and I got into Harvard, but my, it was not going to cover everything, obviously. And my mother said, listen, enough's enough. You went to your father's undergraduate school, and being a lawyer, because we used to go to bar conventions in Texas together, and he wouldn't know anyone. Those were, days were different then. He would have no friends and know no one, and I knew everyone. Everyone knew Helen, you know, and so... Helen's if, your mother. Yeah, and if you want to be a lawyer in Texas, if that's where you want to practice, you need to go to the University of Texas Law School. So I said, fine, Mom, uh, went back to the University of Texas Law School. Is there a professor that stands out uh, from your time at UT Law School? Uh, probably uh, Corwin Johnson, who uh, taught uh, real property, or property. Uh, he was uh, Leon Green, I was his... Uh, uh, I got called on the first day of law school, in the first class, first day of law school, in Leon Green's class. And how he got having a call on me, I have no idea, but he called on me. And uh, so that was the beginning of my law school career. Well, and you finished out your law school career not only as the editor-in-chief of the law review, but top yeah, of your I, class. I did better in Texas. I bit did better in Texas than I did at, uh, as an undergraduate. You know, oh, I did fine at Yale. But I was, at Yale, I was busy making money my junior and senior year because after my horrible experience clearing tables, I figured out there's a better way to do this. 
So I went, I went into business at Yale, and I, was, I ran the student laundry, the cap and gown agency, and I chartered uh, and arranged trips for students in Europe. And my last year at Yale, I made more money than I made for the first two or three years practicing law. So uh, in any event, when I, went to the tax, when I went to law school, okay, I knew you're supposed to study that. And, you know, I had, an, obviously, you have a knack for those things. Study like hell the first semester. But then I got, like, my, when the first grades came in in January, I got, like, a 93 average. Now, they announced Mursky, the uh, librarian who's still there. I was on a program there with Jamail and Reisner and Udoff uh, and Nancy Atlas uh, a few weeks ago. Mursky announced that I still had have the highest grade average at the University of Texas ever. I don't believe that, but that's what we announced. Well, and from there, you went on to a clerkship with uh, Judge John R. Brown. I did. Now, that was in the um, early 60s, a time of great change. And many of the uh, viewers here may not know the incredible role that Fifth Circuit judges like uh, Judge Brown, Judge Goldberg, Judge Godbold played in, in really carrying out Brown versus Board of Education yeah. in the South. What, what do you remember from that clerkship? I don't really, you know. What do I remember from my clerkships? I hate to tell you, partying. Parties I remember well. Judge Brown was a, a wonderful bon vivant. You know, he took me to the symphony, he took me to the opera. He, uh, one of the best times I ever had, really incredible time. I, was, I went from him to clerk for Justice Black. Right. And we were here in Washington, and I was Black's 80th birthday. Lyndon Johnson was in the White House. He invited all the black clerks were invited to the White House to celebrate Justice Black's birthday party. And I told Judge Brown about it, and he wanted to crash the party. I said, well, you're a circuit judge. I don't see no reason why you couldn't crash the party. He crashed the party, and he got totally smashed at the party. I did, too. But we went, over, we went back to uh, the Black's home out in Alexandria, and Judge Brown was quite a topic of conversation for the rest of the year at, at Black's chambers. But Brown, I remember, see, I was very close to Judge Brown, and we did a lot of things together. And I learned he was kind of like a father figure to me, but and kind of close enough to me to be a father. So uh, I, I had, that was a phenomenal experience. And he was officiated at my wedding and did a lot of things personally with me, well, which is quite different than my next clerkship, which was for Hugo Black. Uh, he was old enough to be my grandfather when I clerked for him. But I understand, uh, rumor has it, that you were the first law clerk that he would allow to draft opinions for him. Yeah, well, that's, that, the rumor's correct, but I wasn't sure, I'm not sure it was a voluntary. He had bad cataracts the year I clerked for him. So he had a hard time doing his own writing or reading. But I was allowed, I mean, he did trust me to draft his opinions, and it was, uh, it was a remarkable uh, having clerked for Judge Brown whose writing was always very, I mean, it was flowery. The sentences. Sometimes poetic. There, there was no, well, there was no way you could read a single sentence without taking your breath two or three times because there'd be a lot of dashes in it, a lot of commas and all that. So you'd just be, <laughs> well, when I clerked for Justice Black, not only was his, his leaning towards very lean language, lean usage language, he didn't believe in a flowery language, but I had to take the things I drafted for him and read them to him. And I would go out to his house in Alexandria, or we'd do it at the court, and I would read him. Well, when you are reading something out loud to someone, uh, you better write in very short, sparse uh, language. And that's basically what I did. Learned it. I learned a complete reversal of style, which, by the way, I think is more effective, because I find now that I can, you know, kind of write out my arguments in court. And I write them more like I speak them, and uh, uh, short sen very short sentences, not these long, flowery things. Uh, and now after your clerkship with uh, Justice Black, you, you took the expected route and returned to Houston and began work with uh, Fulbright and Jaworski, yeah. one of the big three in Houston. What was, what kind of was your work like as a young lawyer there in a big Texas firm? Oh, you know, Alan, it was... Uh, uh, boring. You know, I was, uh, the firms in those days, the big firms, they had no recognition of merit. I mean, it was like in your class, every year you get another 5,000, you know, you get a little, the same money as everyone else, no matter how much you work or how little you work, 
or how well you do or, or not. It was at the time I was at Fulbright, there were like a, over a hundred lawyers, barely over a hundred lawyers. But it was Which big, was considered a big firm at the it was time. Considered a huge firm, and it was in the sense that you never had any real feel uh, who was making the decisions or how decisions were made. And see, I, I, I was there for a year as a partner, and as a partner, I remember the year I was there, I never voted on anything. So I mean, in my firm now, everyone votes on everything. So it just it was a totally different experience. I, I liked it. Uh, I was doing mainly defense work, a lot of antitrust defense work, um, but I was clearly, you know, restless, uh, and that's why, you know, so like the last year I was there in 74, that was a year I went into the caper business. We used to call them capers or happenings. I was like uh, with a wild group of people from the Contemporary Arts Museum in Houston who were doing nutty kind of things, like we were into chili cook-offs. Uh, and we took a group to cook at Terlingua as the English chili chafing champions. Uh, did it with Tom McDade, who was a partner there, his wife. She was Lady Lily of Chile. And, you know, nutty kind of crazy things. We had a videographer, you know, like a video guy coming along to record all this craziness. And uh, uh, so uh, the, the, the caper that probably uh, uh, was most well known by, you probably, too young to know about it was Rufus Wallingford and I got a guy hired at Fulbright Jaworski who had been to neither law school nor college. We decided to see if we could get someone through the interviewing process. It was such a joke that we went and got a guy, uh, Carter Townley, who's a picture framer, and I, uh, he only had a high school education. We made him get a sport coat, uh, you know, suit. We took him to Woolworths and took a picture, and we made up. We made, totally made up a bogus resume for him. He was born February 30th, 1949. He went to. He got the Riley L. Finsterbach Moot Court Award. He his comment in the, on the Law Review. He went to uh, University of Utah Law Review. His comment was uh, a dilemma: rap, riparian rights versus the open mind doctrine. I mean, it was totally made up. Uh, and so, uh, in any event, then we had him come actually interview. And the thing we got around the firm was that he's already got a job. He's clerking. We made up a judge's name. He's clerking for this judge in Utah. No one knew the judge's name. And he's already got a job offer from Baker Botts. And, of course, the minute Fulbright heard that, they said, we want to hire him. Okay, so they, they and it went through the whole interviewing process. David Beck was the chairman of the, of the employment committee. And at the, when he was finally hired at the end of the day, uh, I asked David, can we bring him to our, we were having a big firm prom that night. Can I bring him at the Railroad's Country Club? No, you better not bring him. So instead, the litigation section came to my house after the thing. and I had Carter there as the bartender, dressed as a bartender. And so people were coming in who had interviewed him during the day. And they were like, well, do we know this guy from somewhere? Finally, it got so uncomfortable that we then, we, he took off his outfit, and, his, and then we had a, Rufus and I made this tape recording of, uh, you know, I'm, my name is Carter Townley, and today I was hired by the world's largest, one of the world's largest law firms. I've been to need a law school in their college. It tells the whole story, and we had secretly recorded some of the interviews with people there, and we, they were on the tape. And it was a pretty good joke at the time. And like the next day, okay, well, all the secretaries in the office were, as you can imagine, they were around their little workstations listening to the Carter, Carter Townley tapes. You know, one of the members of the executive committee came to see me and said, uh, I think it's been enough fun. Could we, would you give me the tapes? And I gave them all the tapes but one, which I intended to keep. I did keep in my briefcase, except they did something. I, I don't know whether they did it. When I tried to play it a month later, as they, I'm sure they expected I would at a cocktail party or something. Well, whether this it was, was, it was erased. <laughs> <laughs> the tape is gone. Well, whether this incident was a symptom or a cause, you, you left Fulbright to go yeah, back I to Yeah, I think I was, I was restless. Uh -huh. I was restless and bored. And I asked Colonel Jaworski whether I, I had, you know, Dean Keenan asked me to teach. Colonel Jaworski said, wait until you make a partner. After I did, I, I went to see him and said, could I take a leave of absence and go teach law school? And he said, uh, now that you may partner, yeah, you can. And I was intended to be gone for a semester. I moved my family there, uh, my kids were little, and uh, taught antitrust in federal courts. And uh, I basically loved it. And my game plan uh, was that I was going to give up law practice because it was so much better not to have clients or 
no one bothering you, no depositions, no interrogatories, no deadlines. Just write country western music and, and take canoe trips down the down the river in uh, Austin. So, but I told my wife this idea, my first wife Karen, who was from Austin, and I told her I wanted to be a law professor. She said, "Not with me, Bubba." So, she said, "I didn't marry you to be a law professor's wife." So that kind of got me thinking. I said, "Okay, well, you know, I, I don't want to lose my wife over this. So I better Certainly think about not Karen. I better think about something else. What else could I do?" And that's when I began to think. Well, you know, if I'm going back, if I'm going back to the rat race for the purpose of making money, now I'm going to go try to make some real money. And I went around the country that summer, and I entered. The lawyers were great. I talked to Ali Odo and Max Bleacher in California. I talked to a guy named Vernon Patrick in Birmingham. I talked to Harold Cohn and David Berger in Philadelphia. I talked to Lee Freeman in Chicago. Those were the deans of the plaintiff's antitrust bar. And my question to them was, if I wanted to be a plaintiff's contingent fee antitrust lawyer, is there a need for it in the Southwest? Could I make a living in the Southwest? And they were very encouraging. At the time, I was really thinking about staying in Austin, joining up with Lee Godfrey, who we were friends. He was at Graves Darty then. And these guys said, no, you can't do, and I, you can't do this practice in Austin. There, you've got to be in a big commercial center where there are a lot of potential cases to file. Remember, this was in the heyday of antitrust, too. You know, it was a per se day. It was a vertical restrictions day. I mean, a man could actually make some money being a plaintiff's antitrust lawyer. So I decided to go back. And what they told me is they said, you can, there's no one in the Southwest doing it. You could be the first one. But you've got to get with a firm that is comfortable with doing contingent fee cases. And these are expensive cases. It takes a long time when you put water in one end of the pipeline for it to come out the other. So why don't you go look for a firm? You can't do it on your own. I didn't have those resources. And I did. I went to Houston. I interviewed the personal injury firms. All of them were making so much money. This were days pre-tort reform that I said, and I trust. He said, huh? Are you crazy? I found... Mandel and Wright, Sidney Rafkin, and I saw him at a barbershop. I'd known Sidney, and he was, I told him, Sidney, I want to set up a plaintiff's antitrust practice at your firm for you. And he said, well, okay, well, what do you want? I said, just when I was making it Fulbright, 55000 My last, my first year as a partner at Fulbright, I made $55,000, which I remember because I wanted Sidney to duplicate. He said, that's fine. And so I went to work. As a, I was a partner at Mandel and Wright in not knowing whether it really worked or not, but I found out very quickly it would work. There was a real demand for it. The word got out that there was this new guy who was doing contingent fee work on the plaintiff's side of antitrust cases. And uh, that's when I, you know, I had a few cases, had a big case before Judge Singleton, some kind of commercial bribery case under the Robinson Patman Act. Uh, and then it was like in 1977 or 76 in that time frame where a good friend of mine, uh, I just got Gary McGowan was with me, mm -hmm. and uh, I think he was the only one at the time. And we were all scared then about Rule 11. I mean, because there were I, the courts were saying, you know, you don't file a case, one of these cases. Now you don't worry about Rule 11. If it's a report in the Wall Street Journal, that's enough to file. But then you worried about it, and so. Uh, this guy, Vic Samus, comes into my office and said... Uh, We're getting to your first really big case, yeah, the corrugated it. box yeah. class action. Yeah, yeah. and Vic says, uh, Steve, uh, uh, I need, I, I've been subpoenaed to testify before the grand, grand jury. So I said, for what? He said, for their looking at, at price fixing in the corrugated box industry. Well, I was the smartest thing I ever did, was, although I needed the $5,000 that I could have charged him for representing him. I figured, I read some cases that say you can't, you know, you got to be very, if you're going to be class counsel, don't get conflicted. I said, Vic, uh, I'll find you another good lawyer, uh, a real good lawyer, but I don't want to represent you. But I want, and as a quid pro quo for finding you a good lawyer, I want you to come back and have lunch with Gary and I, and we'll take you for some Mexican food and ask you about what was going on, which happened, and he told us, and we wrote a memo, and then within days, we found a client, Adam's Extract, out of Austin, and we were either the first to file or the second to file, but one of the very early filers in the Southern District of Texas, where the grand jury happened to be sitting. So that was the first stroke of luck. The second stroke of luck was that it was a period of time where the plaintiff's bar 
uh, they were doing it all the time, the National Players Bar hated each other. I mean, there was a Chicago school, there was a New York school, there was a Philadelphia group, and they, they were all vying for power, and it was all politics. And uh, so they wanted the case moved to New York, but the other Chicago people wanted Chicago, and they finally ended up compromising on Texas, and I was the guy, the only guy on the case in Houston, and uh, somehow they got persuaded that, okay, let's try him as head of the steering committee. And that, of course, that case gave me my start and my first real fee uh, in life. I didn't get it till the early 80s, but it was a, a substantial fee at the time. Well, you had a great, great success. Yep. Now you're a successful plaintiff's lawyer. You got to buy the plaintiff's lawyer's car. Now, I understand your family was all pushing you to the conventional choice of a Porsche or a Mercedes, but you picked the car of the future. A DeLorean. How did you find out about that, for God's sakes? Steve, well, it's famous. <laughs> well, yeah, that's right. My first, real, first time the money came in, I told my son, Harry, I said, Harry, what kind of car should I buy? I don't really know any cars. He said, Dad, there's this great car coming out. It's got these good, it's stainless steel. So we went and saw one, and I bought it. As I recall, I had to pay more than the sticker price. I mean, they were real, you know, of course, it was a dog car, as it turns out. I mean, I had this car. I ended up, actually, I ended up selling the car to, to Randy Wilson. I think Randy still has it. I don't know whether he sold it or not. He pro Now it's probably worth something. Judge Wilson now has the DeLorean. Yeah, yeah. in Houston. So, but that was my first exotic car. Now, by the way, I drive a Mini Cooper convertible. And when I go into our garage at our building and all my partners had their Mercedes and stretch BMWs lined up in a row, there's this little Mini Cooper. So if I ever take anyone to get in my car, they say, this must be a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't drive much, so it's a fine car for me. Well, Steve, not all the rewards you've had from your practice are, are monetary. I understand from Harry you have some extraordinary grateful clients from the Sabine Pilots case. What was that about? Oh, it was about these, uh, you know, the pilots that get on the, uh, the ships, and there was, uh, there's an organization, they, they do very well, but there was a competing group of pilots. Actually, now that I remember it, I was, that was a defense case. They were defense, see, I did, I, just, I did occasionally switch over to the other side, and I, actually, as time went, I switched more to the other side. Now, my, my career has been, I began as a plaintiff's lawyer, then I began, then I moved into hourly stuff because people that I've been suing were now thinking about hiring me, which was good, and I needed the income too, and then the hourly stuff pays the overhead. And then I did that for about 10 years. That was a, a decade of doing mainly defense hourly work. And then I began seeing all the personal injury lawyers that were making so much money, and I said, hmm, I better get back to my roots. So I kind of got rid of that. And actually, I'm kind of in the phase now where, I mean, for the last five years, uh, I don't do hourly work anymore. Um, it's all contingent fee. Well, we were talking about the Sabine Pilots Oh, case yeah, I forgot about that. Well, yeah, I got <laughs> very, very grateful clients. Yeah, the guy uh, named his son after me. And another case uh, maybe did not get uh, so much money or so much publicity, but you, you went up to Arkansas to help a young attorney general go after some milk-producing price uh, fixers. Bill Clinton. He was the attorney general. Uh, now, of course, I had no idea. I just thought he was a nice guy, but I didn't had no idea he was going to be where he got to be. He was the attorney general of Arkansas. He hired me through a friend in Little Rock to represent the state uh, who was suing the dairies for fixing the price of school milk. And uh, I spent many, many hours in his office kind of telling him what was going on in the case. He was very interested in it, very involved. And uh, that's how I met Mr. Clinton. And both of you went on to bigger and better things. Well, uh, he did for sure. You mentioned doing um, defense work, and, and in fact, one of the cases that you and I had, ironically, I was representing the small startup microprocessor company, and you were defending Intel. But then you saw, uh, went back to your roots, and uh, were involved as the plaintiff's lawyer in two of the biggest hits that Microsoft took. Oh, yeah. Well, that's right. We, uh, we began, the first case was the Caldera case, and uh, the Carol Caldera case was uh, over their monopoly of the operating system. I represented a company called uh, 
uh, well, Caldera was a company. Caldera had bought the DR DOS operating system, which had been put out of business essentially by Microsoft. And that resulted in a big settlement, and everyone went to Tahiti to celebrate. That's the first time I, and only time I've been to Tahiti. Well, the newspaper said it was a reported $300 million. I understand That's you proper. can't. Right now, Comment. you know, it wouldn't matter. It's pro that's probably right, but I don't even remember. So I can't violate the protective order or the confidentiality agreement. And then we represented uh, uh, Nobel uh, suing Microsoft. That was even a bigger settlement. That was reported 700 or 800 million. Uh, and that was over Microsoft's obvious attempt to uh, put Nobel out of business, out of business in certain of its products. Uh, and then, uh, uh, meanwhile, we were representing other people. B was a c company uh, that we had an antitrust set case against uh, Microsoft, a company called Opera. We had another same kind of follow-on kind of case against Microsoft. Uh, so, uh, and, and now, uh, I don't have any more antitrust cases against Microsoft, but I've become a patent lawyer. So I got I have a Microsoft in about six patent cases right now as the defendant. Now in those Microsoft cases, you were assisted by a very able young lawyer, Harry Sussman. Yes, in some of them for sure. And, and Harry, after clerking for Justice Kennedy, came back to Houston and is not only your son but your partner now. He is quite an antitrust family in addition well, to you and Harry. Uh, uh, your brother Tommy was that's right. has been the board of governors liaison with the antitrust section. That's correct. I forgot about that. His, His wife, wife Susan, who's now a judge, she uh -huh. was active in the section. And um, uh, speaking of the section, you were one of the very first plaintiffs' lawyers to uh, go on the council of the section. Uh, what do you have to say to our viewers, particularly some of the younger lawyers, about? the antitrust section if you're interested in this field? Well, I think the, I mean, it was a great section. I mean, I remember, as I, I think I told you before the interview, uh, the, w the annual meeting was like the biggest event to meet other lawyers. The spring meeting. Yeah, know. I mean, and listen, I was there, I was there pimping for cases. I mean, that was it. I was trolling. I was going around trying to meet as many people, passing out as many cards, and because I was starting up, and, and Gary McGowan, the first time I met him, he was my first partner was at the bar of the Shoreham Hotel. Francie Beck, now Francie Crane, I met her for the first time at the bar. I used to interview at the bar. All my lawyers were hired right at that bar of the Shoreham because it was convenient. The section met there. And so we had great meetings. I love the, par the cocktail parties were like unbelievable. I mean, you know, just you would just eat yourself crazy. They were fantastic. Now, it's become more difficult currently because these parties are all over. But they're great parties, and I think there was, I mean, the antitrust section's terrific. I think there has been, um, uh, you know, there's been some effort, I think it varies over time, to involve the plaintiff, to get the plaintiff's point of view. Uh, obviously, it has been a very, for the last 40 years, uh, have since uh, Reagan was elected, and Reaganomics in the Chicago School of Way of Thinking, that antitrust is all about efficiency, the big is beautiful. Uh, this has made it, uh, uh, and the antitrust regulation of any kind, including lit mainly litigation, or certainly prominently litigation, stands in the way of the success of American businesses competing worldwide. That this, for there's been a total decline in the antitrust laws, almost to the point where I jokingly say the antitrust laws have been repealed by the, the judiciary, and so. Uh, it has been a very difficult time, and then the section, of course, those pe you're making a living doing what you got to go with the flow, which is mainly representing big companies, defending them, and so you go to these meetings. And for a long time, I didn't like to go because, you know, there was just too much plaintiff bashing going on. Uh, it was it was all plaintiff bashing, and to go, I, I could read the opinions. I didn't need to go to the meeting to remind myself that my practice was going to hell in a handbasket because. The courthouse doors were being closed to the plaintiffs. Now, I mean, I believe there's going to be every pendulum swings. I think we're getting ready to sing, see another swing of the pendulum because I think Americans now are realizing that not all regulation is bad, uh, that, that uh, the free enterprise system does not work in every area. 
uh, you just can't have unrestrained competition in every area of the economy. And uh, as a result, uh, and, we, and we're about to experience, I think, a horrible economic meltdown and recession, and uh, probably with a new administration. Uh, and so I think people are going to begin saying, you know, we, maybe we swung the pendulum a little too far to the right. Now let's swing it back a little to the left. And I hope that, that young lawyers, particularly who are interested in the plaintiff's side, continue to be active in the section and come. And they should be encouraged because I think that private practice is going to get more, uh, uh, it's going to be bigger than it. I mean, you know, right now the only private cases basically are price fixing cases. But as time passes, uh, there'll be other areas where I think antitrust will come back. Uh, it's very active right now, obviously. Internet, I mean, you know, it should, should be called the international antitrust section because, in fact, uh, most of the action is going on in Europe or in Japan or Korea. There's a lot of action going on, enforcement action. Uh, and uh, it'll come back to the United States. Now, one of the things you did while in the section, you were the editor of, I believe it was the section's first effort at putting out uh, model civil antitrust jury instructions. And um, working with the jury and perceived problems and perceived solutions uh, is something that you've, you've stuck with as, yeah, as part because, of your... Yeah, because, I mean, you know, I believe that the jury is a uniquely American institution it's not uniquely a democratic institution because there are a lot of democracies that don't have a jury, but jury is uniquely American. And I think it's uh, a chance to give the average person a chance to participate in government uh, and by jury service, and that juries basically reach the right result. There's been a lot of attack on the jury system. But part of it, I think, has come uh, justifiably from the perception that jurors don't really comprehend. You know, there were suggestions that complicated antitrust cases should not be tried by juries. There should be some special judge. There should be some exception, complexity exception to the Seventh Amendment. Uh, well, that never got anywhere in the courts, but there's always some, you know, that affects the way people think. So there are fewer and fewer jury trials today. There's more in the antitrust area. Summary judgment is very common. The attack on the other side's expert is very common. And these cases are not being resolved by jury trials. Part of it's not understanding, not understanding the, uh, uh, that the juries can really comprehend. So we need to work on giving the public confidence in jury comprehension. The first thing is to get the instructions written in plain English. They are a mess today. I mean, you read the instruction on what, it, what constitutes uh, anti-competitive conduct, and you come away, or the, you know, rule of reason instruction, you come away scratching your head. There's no person that can understand it. There's no lawyer that can understand it. So. Uh, we need to make them so the juries understand. We need to give the juries preliminary instructions. We need to give them the verdict form before the trial begins so they know what questions that they have to answer. Give them written copies of the instructions before the trial begins so they can keep them with them during the trial and improve things to make it easier for them to understand. Let them deliberate as they go. Let them ask questions. Let them take notes. Let demonstrative evidence be put back in the jury room. Uh, I mean, think of a hundred things, you know, how would you go about, if you were teaching a law school class or any kind of class, a high school class, to improve the comprehension of your students and their learning, uh, and just do the same thing with the jury system. So yes, I'm, I've been, that, since that time, I've been very active in uh, improving the jury system. Well, Steve, starting with just yourself, trolling the spring meeting for talent and cases, you've now grown Sussman and Godfrey while it's still a boutique. It's a 100-lawyer boutique. Well, 90 lawyers, 90-lawyer boutique. Coast to coast. Tri-coastal, five offices. Uh, you know, it's great. I'm very proud of, you know, we've had very good people. Uh, some so have gone on to be judges. Some have gone on to be yeah. a mayor, perhaps the next governor. 94% of the lawyers at my firm clerk for a federal judge. That's probably the highest percentage of any firm in the country. What parting words would you have for a young lawyer, maybe in the same position where you were those many years ago? Well, I think lawyers, I, I, I would urge lawyers, when they are young, when they're in their early 30s or mid-30s, I was 35, to be a little more, take more risk. Go try something. Maybe go with a smaller firm. Maybe do something different. Uh, maybe go with a firm that doesn't really have any. You know, do, do something that is, be a risk taker. Be entrepreneurial. 
because, uh, you know, it's so much fun to be entrepreneurial. And here, you know, you can go do the same old thing, go with the big firms, I don't knock it. But if you do that by age 65, you're going to be retiring and ready to retire. All my contemporaries are on the retirement track. I'm just beginning anew for the first time. I moved to New York, uh, my an office, I'm living there part time, I'm out pimping cases again, and I'm having the best time of my life. And so I got another 10 years. All because, you know, I am, I'm a risk taker. Steve, thanks for sharing that with us. Enjoyed it.